anytime a claim is made that sounds like this, where this frequency does this universally, or this frequency liberates DNA or fear or unlocks ancestral trauma, anything like this, that's a part of the, the buzzwords, the hype, the false notions where music really could elicit any kind of effect in you if it's properly designed and if it is in a certain kind of tone or a certain kind of emotion or movement, that will be a large part of what kind of effect it elicits, less to do with the specific frequency it's tuned to. So. Torkum, welcome to Discover More. Thank you, Benoit. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. A lot of gurus and a lot of air quotes, so-called experts, have been coming on on social media talking about vibrational sound healings. And of course, that's good because it's creating some traction into the important work that you're doing. But the flip side is a lot of misinformation and lack of accuracy and evidence-based approach. Any thoughts there? The first thing that's really important to, to mention here, which you kind of alluded to, it's always a good thing when people are interested or curious about health, wellness, expanding consciousness, like getting into meditation. So just off the bat, that's a great thing in general to see reflected in society right now, that people are curious and they want to learn more. But with that said, just to point to my own personal experience, you know, when I started this back in 2011, 12, I didn't really have a lot of uh, models to go after and I, I, it wasn't yet, you know, as pronounced or prolific in, in culture and society as, as we we're finding today. For that reason, you know, it was something that for me came very personally. It was a direct response to my own healing, my own meditations, and by extension, you know, that of my friends, my community, my colleagues who also resonated with it, no pun intended. That really helped pave the way for me to find, create, and explore my own avenue with this field. But in doing so, you know, here we are, fast forward, it's totally blown up. You know, it's you have major mainstream publications, you have YouTube videos with millions of views, you have celebrities who are posting, you know, the, their session or their experience. So those are all good things. But as you said, one of the drawbacks or the side effects of that, especially how fast everything kind of rapidly accelerated to this level of expansion, is that, and you talk to any sound healer who's been doing this or meditation facilitators are doing this for a while and they'll tell you th there's a lot of like misinformation, inaccurate information, a lot of language or buzzwords or terms that either like set up a false premise of what's happening or imply or suggest something that may be taking place on like a cellular kind of level that as an individual, it'd be really hard to prove or validate some of those claims. So the, it's, it's created a circumstance where I'd say like 80% or 90% of the perception of this is is solely based on a premise or a notion that you would have to and have hope and faith like must be working, you know, and I think that level of ambiguity, uh, we could do better. There's no reason why we can't apply science and methods and findings and communicate with each other to kind of get closer and closer to the truth of what is this sound therapy? Uh, how is it impacting us? How does it affect us? So that's a little bit about, you know, my views on it. Now, as far as what is it that these gurus are saying or like what is it that they communicate or convey? Well, it's a very much a copy paste kind of part of the, the Internet culture where in my personal view, like anytime a claim is made that sounds like this, where this frequency does this universally or this frequency liberates DNA or fear or unlocks ancestral trauma, anything like this, that's a part of the, the buzzwords, the hype, the false notions where music really could elicit any kind of effect in you if it's properly designed and if it is in a certain kind of tone or a certain kind of emotion or movement, that will be a large part of what kind of effect it elicits, less to do with the specific frequency it's tuned to. So it's blown up this whole multi-million, maybe even billion dollar market where people have a product or service and they say, oh, this frequency does this. And when you listen to it, it's basically a sine wave. It's you know, it's kind of almost annoying. Maybe you would resonate. Sometimes you put on something and you're like, that's just a high pitched, annoying kind of sine wave. What is that even actually doing? And if it is doing something, you know, am I able to measure that and, and learn about like my process with this thing and how it's improving or not improving my health? Like there's really no way. So instead I've kind of just started over and um, built my own understanding and 
it's been more about uh, unlearning than to learn. In psychotherapeutic space, one of the really important metrics is we call it OMA, Outcome Measurement uh, Assessment. Because as you talked about, how do we measure the progress? How do we know if it's actually effective versus perceived effectiveness based on releasing of DNA, all these really grandiose big words? And I think the undercurrent of that, Torkham, is the idea that no single modality, even psychedelic, and no matter how wonderful they are, none of them is end-all, be-all, and none of them can release your accumulative trauma in one session. That's just not how healing and progression works. I totally agree. And for me personally, my background is both in meditation, transcendental meditation, actually, uh, specifically, and music production, electronic music, guitar, just general music production. So I'm able to bring both of those uh, skill sets and understandings into the field of uh, atmospheric, you know, soundscape drones for health, wellness, rest, trauma release. And with that said, you know, the understanding, the meditation side of things with the music side of things is it's really allowed me to be very accommodating and understanding of the process, especially the meditation process. It's something that with one session you can get so much value from, but it's more about how you do it over time that realigns and puts you on a course that you could only achieve through consistency. That's why it's called a practice. And with music, we say that's why you play music because music shouldn't have to be work and meditation, and it can't just work like as a one-off. Meditation is a practice and music is a play. And so between those two kind of dynamics there is how I've learned my own personal truths and the relationships between things and what is authentic and what is interconnected to larger patterns outside of myself. And so I very much think the fundamental important aspect of meditation and music is, and those as individual things, but them also combined, is that we're able to give someone a sense of tension release. And it's through this process that I believe it puts people in a, in a better and a more suited position to be able to confront their obstacles, to be able to get some space, and then to be able to return back with fresh insight, fresh ideas. And I think that that's a, a really reliable, sustainable way to kind of course correct your life towards more optimal ways of being, thinking, and feeling. Less about a frequency unlocking mystic secrets or less about a one single psychedelic trip, you know, showing you everything and now you know it all. It's really important to integrate, integration of these things and how the integration moves you in to time, through time, into the future is really what's key. So these are supportive tools to help support someone on their journey. I love the process. I've meditated every single day, seven days a week for about four years now. And I think it's, it's about buy-in, right? Because the buy-in for meditation is you can prolong your focus. You can tune out a certain radio chatter internally, X, Y, and Z. But the true benefits is the process. It's the permanent change of your brain structure, the permanent shrinkage of amygdala, which is a fear control center in your brains. But of course, these are deeper that you have to, you can only experience these deeper aspects of the benefits once you engage in this dance. And I want to use that to segue into the sound wave therapy, where what are some of the buy-ins that's out there? And what is this modality? And what's the actual surface level benefits? And what are the, some of the deeper level benefits? Because you are the expert on this matter. Just off the bat, right? We talked about how meditation has these positive effects. It lowers stress chemicals. It increases dopamine, serotonin. It helps regulate your biochemistry in a way that's way more optimal and supportive for regeneration of cells, tissue, and inclination to just have a deeper quality of rest. So just off of those, those basics alone, we know meditation is amazing. So is listening to music. Listening to music has incredible and profound effects on the brain, on the system, on the organs, on the bones. In fact, when we use our own voice or sing, our entire bone system becomes like a pipe organ, like an acoustic Whoa. chamber. So our whole body, based off our mass, size, density, bones, on account of those factors is our voice and the quality of our voice. So in a sense, you know, we are one big instrument. And so when we, when we listen to sound, Immediately, we bypass the active, critical, logical thinking brain. And we immediately start to enliven and unlock and open the creative, receptive, pattern recognition side of the brain. And after something like 10, 15 minutes of a deep inward listening, 
you start to notice your mind and the subtle thoughts actually start to change. So this is kind of how we have an understanding that that our brain waves, our brain state, our level of thought, level of coherence, these are all correlated with how much activity is in the mind. And we all tend to have excess activity in the mind because we have cell phones, smartphones, got to go here, got to be there, got to be on time, got to go to sleep, got to wake up, do it all over again. And so unless we actually give ourselves a chance, a reprieve, where we consciously check out, have a practice of a sort in which we're not sleeping, we're not quite awake, but we're in this in-between. It's I compare it to like a CPU rest mode. And so when we're in this space, not only are there profound effects on the body and the physiology and the biochemistry, but the mind as well. And then what we would consider to be consciousness, you know, however you perceive or interpret that. But that's, I would just sum that up to like your mental faculties and your logic and reasoning. And then there's this observer and the observer is mindful and aware of the mind. It's also aware of the body. It's also aware of itself. And so I would say that's the conscious observer, the, the thing that's kind of overseeing everything. And if you can zoom out one more time, the thing overseeing, the thing overseeing. And so if we could be on that level of looking at our life and looking at our day to day and our challenges, it's a lot less uh, scary and sharp and in our face, literally. Whereas when we're in our mind, when we're in our level of excess thoughts, activity, we identify with the body, identify with the chattering monkeys of the mind. We have a really local, contained, confined, and sheltered kind of circumstance in which we're not really tapping into the frequencies and the wavelengths that are all encompassing and all around us. By listening to sound waves, just like meditation, they do similar things, but they also really lean on each other. So when you're using sound waves to meditate, you're getting the benefits that meditation brings forth on the brain, on the body, on the mind, on the consciousness. But now you're incorporating and introducing literally something that's propagating through air. It's compressing and expanding particles. It's traveling and it's physically touching your skin. It's physically entering your ears. It's tickling your ears and sending signals to the brain. It's invigorating muscle body, muscle body groups, even down to the bones. If we want to talk about cells, which a lot of time people talk about frequencies and cellular and cellular healing, we would have to talk about kilohertz and megahertz. At that range, we can actually really isolate sound to a localized cellular area, like a clump of cells, like tumor infected cells. But as far as music, sound that we listen to between 20 and 20,000 hertz or cycles, that's not something that we typically correlate to like affecting or impacting cells directly. But there is research to show that listening to music and being involved with arts more specifically does have a positive effect on DNA. There's a lot there. And I do want to zoom in on one point where you talked about the act of listening to music has the profound and pronounced impact short term and long term. Well, me and my fiance, we got a house plant recently and we've been doing a lot of affirmations. And as you know, plants or any sentient beings respond to affirmations and affirmations is speech. And it's auto vibrational. It's also sounds, as you talked about. It's like the physical and the metaphysical components. But I do want to go a little bit deeper and ask you this because I think a lot of people, whether you're new to vibrational sound wave healing or therapy or not, I think a lot of us understand the importance of white noise. A lot of us listen to white noise when we fall asleep. Uh, a lot of therapists, we have a white noise machine outside of the room yes. to prevent noise or confidential information spilling through. And even for novices and people who have no concepts or knowledge, they just understand that it's almost like intrinsically that, huh, something about why noise, I don't know what it is, but soothing. Right. And it comes to monkey brain chatters that you talked about. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that and then feel free to go deeper? If Absolutely. You like. So tension release. We are beings that hold and store tension and then we need release. Rest and dynamism. We dynamically live our day and then we sleep at night and then we do it all over again. Everything that we begin, maintain, and end, if you zoom out enough, it just looks like oscillating sound waves. Mm. So everything is in constant cyclic motion. So to get back to your point on the white noise, there's white noise, pink noise, brown noise, slightly different from each other, but in that same kind of like background, simple tone. White noise is actually all of the frequencies 
superimposed on top of each other. Static white noise signal is literally, if you took all the notes and you just kept adding them, adding them, adding them at varying amplitudes, you would eventually end up with white noise. Oh. So within white noise, you can actually extrapolate each of the harmonics and just like amplify them. What in nature sounds like white noise? Rain, titter tatters of rain on the floor, maybe some background like thunder or wind, wind kind of moving through canyons and rocks waves crashing in a tidal kind of way, leaves bristling, a bunch of leaves bristling around you. The oldest sounds are the ones that generally impact us profoundly across the board, everybody, equally. I think it's a matter of simply just looking at the origin story of our evolution from water-based creatures to land-based creatures to eventually like becoming mammalian and then creating culture, passing progeny, and then creating society. Along that way, we're talking, you know, millions of years. And so if you look at our ancient proto-humans, let's say maybe a million years ago, 500,000 years ago, they were not actually developing uh, instruments or utilizing sound or music in the way that we would associate with primitive humans until around, I'm going to be really uh, liberal with this, but 70,000, more realistically around like 50, 60,000 years ago. And that's when we start to see things like a flute carved out of a branch or like um, dried animal hides turned into a, a drum, you know, between like 60 and 40,000 years ago. So if we're looking at 500,000 years ago, just off that premise, you know, fine, there's no instruments. So there's no real musical notion to the day to day of these hominids. But there absolutely is an understanding of their surroundings and understanding when there's a threat or when there might be a flood coming when the electromagnetism of the temperature of the air is changing and a storm might be coming, what the thunder might mean, what the lightning might imply. So there is over generations an established understanding of what these primordial sounds inform these proto hominids. And over time, you know, after eons, then you have a really established primal connection to the sound of rain and thunder and natural sounds. Just simply being with them elicits an effect because it's kind of like when you're in the womb. When you're in the womb, it's a very primordial aquatic kind of this amniotic sac. You would almost envision what it must feel like to hear and feel your mother's heartbeat mm. and how that simple rhythm, that simple, consistent and natural overarching beat coming from up there is kind of making its way down into the sack of fluid that you are in encompassing you. So it's almost like all the stages that we could think of the earliest stage involved us acknowledging and working with primordial sound. And then as we evolve, it's, it's actually about acknowledging how we respond or feel with that primordial sound. And so here we are today, you know, people listen to white noise, listen to oceans, they listen to, to listen to waves, listen to wind. I think that what's happening there is it works so effectively because it's simulating something that has worked consistently for eons. And it sounds in line with what does and will cause a positive effect in the body. The main fundamental reason why that is, is probably has something to do with bypassing that active thinking mind, putting you in a state where something bigger, larger, more grandiose than you and consistent allows you to go through phases of tension release where you realize you're thinking and then you're not, you're kind of, you're surrendering to some other greater force. And by surrendering to that, then the white noise or the album that you have or the sound in the background or the thunder and the crashing when you're in the caves as a proto-human. These are things that you almost drop that fight or flight active thinking self for and then you surrender to that greater thing. And it's in that process of surrender, which is where we find rest, which is where the body can recuperate. And I think that's what's fascinating. That's what should make it an interesting and appealing venture for anybody to be curious about because you don't have to be a pro and you don't have to e even be like an airy fairy like woo woo spiritual person to acknowledge that we are humans humans respond to music the brain responds to sound and music and we all could benefit equally from achieving rest and regeneration in order to be more optimal like I think this is this is exactly why it's a trend this is why it's it's expanding now yeah this is fascinating because it sounds like the sound therapy and sound healing is attractive because they're tapping into the evolutionary mechanism that's deeply embedded within us. 
And my brain is going somewhere weird because I foresee us having six different podcasts within this podcast. But with my Christian faith, right, we talk about creationism in the Bible, quite literally or not, that's not the point. But God said, let there be sound, let there be light. And his act of creationism is enacted through voice of commands. And whether you talk about when you're in the womb, pre-birth, which is the origins of life, you're originating based on your mother's heartbeats. It's almost like when you're dying deathbed, if you're lucky and fortunate, a life well lived, you have people around you, families, the chatters, physicians, whatever. If you're alone, you'll be with your heartbeats when you die. So it's almost like the sounds accompanied us when we're born and when we die. Yeah, it's completely true. Out of all your senses, your touch, your taste, your sight, your sound. I think I missed one there, but mm -hmm. in any case, the sound is the only one that your brain is actually delegating like a, a process. Like when you hit control, out delete and you look at task manager and you're checking out, oh, what are all the processes running? Oh, and that task, I don't need all that extra RAM used. The brain, when your eyes are open, you're, pro you're processing sight and space. And um, when you're talking, thinking, uh, creating, you know, different nodes and different parts of the brain are firing off in correspondence. All of our senses, when we're awake, you know, we're utilizing our senses. And so signals are going to the brain. But when we're asleep, we're not really looking at anything. We're not really touching anything. So there's not those signals going to the brain. But sound is always being sent to the brain. From the moment you're mm. born to the moment you die, the brain never stops hearing. And the reason and processing sound and the reason is because you need to know if a tiger is coming closer to your neck. You need to know if an explosion happens like right behind you, you need to wake up and immediately run and get out of there or something, fight or flight. So our, the sound is actually a really quick and uh, effective and fast way to alert your whole system that something is wrong and where that thing that's wrong is because we can hear amplitude, how loud, which direction and all that's happening through our ears. It's really incredible in our brain. But so much information is, is there. And so while you're asleep, you're still processing sound. You may not be seeing anything or hearing anything. So I find that fascinating is, is if you were to like have a recording of everything you've ever heard, it would just be one big like life-sized file that's mm. never really stopped. That and, is. And that's what connects us to the past and our future self is this almost inexplainable sense that is always on, you know, no pun intended. It kind of doesn't make sense that all the other ones shut off, but not our hearing, which, which goes to your point is it must be intrinsically connected to the nature of creation in itself, to primordial states, to like perhaps what is beyond the great unknown, you know, but vibration, sound, frequency, the perception of sound and how that creates a spatial map of our surroundings. These are all interconnected. I think fascinating is a great word. And it's my brain's going also somewhat weird. And I want to not quite quantum, but I want to get cosmic very briefly. I don't know too much. But what I do know is gravitational waves, which has been first documented scientifically in 2015 in California, because it was a theory before. And gravitational wave is the most concrete evidence that time is a construct. Because by the time we feel or we can perceive the ripple in space that we call gravitational wave through the force of gravity, by the time we perceive this, the stars or the spaces or galaxies that originated the gravitational wave might have already ceased to exist because it takes billions and billions of light years. But if you really simplify gravitational waves or sounds, it's a ripple in space. The difference is we can perceive it on Earth because we have air and space is vacuum, so you cannot perceive it. Not really a concrete question, but any thoughts there? It's a very interesting finding. Quantum does this, is very disruptive for a lot of theories. And uh, I don't claim to be like a PhD in physics or anything like that. And but I'm very much interested and I, I do my best, just like anyone, to kind of understand and extrapolate, okay, what's the significance? Uh, how does my brain process or understand like what this means or... or from my very limited understanding of it, you know, space is kind of a fabric. So the more particles are uh, densely compacted to each other, like a planetary body or a moon, then the gravitational field is on account of its mass, size, and density. And we discuss the same principles that, believe it or not, are by now a very antiquated set of beliefs, which Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans were early contributors to this idea. I believe there's a Pythagoras quote that, that states something similar to everything in the universe has a frequency or vibration on account of its size, mass, and density. 
And so they understood the mathematics, the uh, trigonometry, the, the calculus, the geometry, as well as the harmonics and the correlation between form and sound. Because bear in mind, you know, Pythagoras also was the contributor to the understanding of ratios with strings mm -hmm. by plucking right in half, you get an octave, the third. So that's how, you know, we have our current understanding of the intersection between mathematical theorems, space, form, sound, vibration. Yeah, and the sacred geometry as well. A sacred geometry builds on this idea that demonstrates that the physical 3D world and even the molecules, the hydrogen, the oxygen, they are fundamentally suspended by what we believe to be the type of sound or frequency relating to cymatics. If you do a cymatics experiment, it's the study of how vibration equates to a certain form suspended. So they vibrate a panel with sand at a different frequency. And if they raise or lower the pitch, then the sand creates a completely different kind of mandala effect. And so the working kind of theory is that all the physical world as we know it is actually that seems concrete is fundamentally suspended by, by vibration, even down to like molecules and the way that they're structured is connected to sacred geometry, which is the most optimal way to fit space within a space time continuum, but that are intrinsically connected to, to the one that we're in. And that could only work in a sacred geometric model where there's a micro macro, there's, there's like a nucleus and a core, but then there's like an outer shell that sits on it. And then you can zoom out and put a shell around that. And so this idea, uh, it's also a hermetic principle, which is as above, so below, mm. which is a very old ancient principle that implies that the universe on a cellular and on a cosmic scale have uh, crazy correlations as now we can see through like a image of a pupil versus a galaxy, a freeway network versus your bloodstream. The parallels. There's a lot of parallels. So, so this is kind of what the ancients were also alluding to as above, so below the, the fractal nature of the universe and how that ties into sacred geometry as a solution that would kind of fill in the void of, well, well, how is it interconnected? How is it able to scale infinitely up and down? Well, it can, if it has the proper structural integrity that supports that kind of inward outward expansion and that also like dovetails into like light right like physics has proved that light is both a wave and a particle correct it's one of the only cases if not the only case in which a light and particle coexist yeah a particle and wave coexist forgive me right and of course sound wave is not light but it's a different manifestations and so you brought up quantum very briefly. I do want to go in there real quick. From your deep research and understandings and your hyper-focused interest in the past many, many years, like what does quantum mechanics say about high frequencies? And what is this slogan on social media? Oh, high frequencies, low frequencies. They're, on a, they're resonating at a higher vibrations. They're on a lower vibrations. Can you contextualize and yeah. maybe even debunk? Yeah, absolutely. So as far as frequencies... And high or low, and then quantum, like there's actually not really a correlation there. Mm. And I can get into that. But the second part of you talking about like, hey, you're not being at a high frequency, man. You're being low vibe, you know, <laughs> like this kind of way we talk about things. So for a while, I've been actually saying the problem we have now is that too many people are trying to raise their frequency so high that everyone is like a 5D shamanic, like extraterrestrial, <laughs> like angelic. It's like, I think, you know, you went a little bit too high there. There's something about being humbled and staying close to the earth and like kissing the floor. You know, there's something about knowing where you're from and being able to get down and dirty with the mud and being comfortable with the human experience. Mm. When I started this work, I had an aversion to my human self in a sense. I was like a vegetarian. I'm like, you know, running, exercising, going on experiences, meditating. I'm at such a clear and expanded state of being that almost this like um, narcissistic, self-loving kind of like, I'm a guru, like I'm better than others. It's dangerous because you actually have to acknowledge and, and nip it in the butt. If you don't do that, a lot of people get this spiritual ego where they're, they're at such a place of clarity and like self mastery that it's just the next natural step of the human condition is just to subconsciously even to be like, well, I'm better than these people because they're not doing those things. Kind of like these fitness Instagram pages with the big buff dudes who are like, if you're not working out and you're not on my level, then you're beneath me. That kind of vibe, you know, and people need some, some people need that to get motivated to kind of rise up. 
to improve their body, but we're not talking about improving your body. We're talking about your psyche and your consciousness. And this idea of someone being better or worse than you, it's a really low way to think. Instead, it's, it's more like we each have our gifts. We each have to discover what's within us. And at any point, a child can teach an elderly person. An elderly person could teach a child. Like anyone in any stage can unlock and access universal truths that could be to the benefit of themselves, their community, and the world at large. And so when we talk about like vibrating higher, it's just simply the idea that on a vertical scale of up being optimal and down being like, if I had to say, Hey, would you want your bank account to go up or down, you know, on that basic level, you know, you have to be kind of silly to say, yeah, I want my bank account to go down. Like down in this scenario is not good up in this scenario is good. And so when we're talking about raising your frequency, we're, we're implying that like raising your frequency higher is good. Point I'm trying to make is I've understood it's more granular. Sometimes lowering your frequency is better because you're so high, you're so intense. We talked about active excess thinking and energy, which is what most people suffer from. I think that's when lowering your vibration is the right medicine. So telling someone, hey, you need to lower your vibe. I think that's actually applicable and useful. You don't hear this ever. And obviously, you know, we're, we're, it's semantics, right? And we're playing with words. But generally speaking, I think people should strive to raise their frequency. And what that means is like, eat better food for yourself. Think of yourself more highly to imply that which you can aspire up to. Because we want to be up looking down at our past. We don't want to be down looking up at our past. But as far as what's actually applicable, sometimes lowering your vibration is the right thing because you find yourself too high strung, too much stuck in a limited level of thinking that you keep replaying cycles and you can't really get solutions. That's actually when we talk about meditation, lowering your breath rate, lowering your heart rate, lowering the brain activity. So in that sense, lower your vibration. And to go to the first um, question you, uh, or premise, you talked about quantum and high frequency. Newtonian physics, as we know it, encompasses the molecular world, the cellular world, the atomic world. It encompasses the world in which our bodies exist and the stars and planets exist. The, the physics and the uh, law of thermodynamics, etc., these are all uniform on all these scales that are contained. But quantum is just under that low end threshold of where Newtonian physics doesn't really apply anymore. And so this idea of sound propagation, particles in air that sound moves through, in which there's periods, peaks and valleys, amplitude and frequency and modulation and some kind of metric of a higher versus lower, that ceases to exist at the lower threshold of Newtonian. When you get to quantum, it's more like all of those possibilities simultaneously exist in quantum. Therefore, there isn't really a linear time or propagation of events that would imply that something's higher or lower. Instead, quantum would say that higher frequency exists at the same time the lower one does and every single possibility in between. Why quantum computation is becoming a thing, quantum encryption, decryption, quantum internet, because it's, 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 it's showing itself to be actually a really novel and advanced way to get what you need only when you need it, but then there's always something new coming out and, and there's so much, there's so little we know, kind of like the bottom of the ocean, you know, we, we, we have a lot to learn about quantum. I guess the progressions of our scientific findings are limited by the observational data and quantum is by nature is unobservable. And I really love connecting the metaphysical with the physical, the in concrete with the concrete on the show. What I want to zoom in on, Torkum, is the idea of context. Because as you talked about, quantum requires contextualizations of the observations, right? Based on what you need, based on the context. And it's also idea that every possibility is within one. To me, it sounds like a multidimensional aspect, just like us humans. And it dovetails into everything we talked about where the quick rapid rise of psychedelic renaissance, or in this case, sound wave therapy renaissance, it's great but you lose the nuances and you lose the context. And I think I see the connections and through lines with this quantum reality we're talking about with everything we just talked about where you must slow down and contextualize and recontextualize and reap what works for you. 
And by doing that, you cannot get lost in the process of the spiritual ego of because I have the access point to certain domain that other people don't because of the privileges of our circumstances and informations and access points and education, that doesn't give us a right to look down on other people. Because as you said, as above, so is below, right? Mm -hmm. But to me, it really screams the importance of once again, context, context, and context. Absolutely, yes. If you have a near-death experience, and you come out of that, you could be a completely like secular, even atheist, like depressed kind of person and have a near near death experience and come out of it and completely just almost be rewired and have the level of compassion, empathy and understanding like a guru who's been practicing for 30 years. You would have almost no differentiation between like, wow, that both of them have this deep understanding and care and empathy and ability to reach through to me and make me feel in a way where no other person really can. That's kind of the gift that waits for all of us is a kind of death, mini death, rebirth, sense of like mastery of the self, which awaits us all in this life. Because to be disgruntled, stuck, limited is definitely not the way because it doesn't lead to or yield anything impactful for the perpetuity of the story. And that's all this is. It's just one ongoing story. The t even the timeline they're saying is like a lie. Like there is no linear time. It's just like you said, it's a multidimensional kind of cluster of multiple possibilities and scenarios in which at any moment we're directly involved with how it's playing out based off of our obser observation. And so I guess my message is like anyone at any point can have an experience or make a decision to radically change the way they perceive themselves in reality to kind of leverage what this quantum shows us about the nature of observation, the power of the mind and the power to acknowledge that the physical and concrete reality is just that an illusion. And it's able to be almost like the matrix, like Neo, you can actually work the code or manipulate the field in a sense and directly benefit from the impact that you, your awareness itself can have on your life. And that, that shift alone. And that's why we, I call it quantum harmonics. I, it's like a sound system designed to put you in a zero point field where those possibilities are accessible, where you can observe and peep into different potential realities and then, you know, potentially choose and, and act on them. So, yeah, I really like that you talked about like death, rebirth, right? And going full circle to how we started this conversation, Torkum, you talked about learning and unlearning. And you talked about it's more important to unlearn than learn. Because as you know, unlearning is harder than learning. Of course, neuroplasticity, all that aside. So I want to segue into a personal question for you, Torkum. As a master sound healer with decades plus of experiences, and you're also evolving as we speak, right? With the new opening of your dome space that I'm excited to check out on August 5th, the grand opening. Are there any fallacies or beliefs or ideas that you held once and either you let go or unlearned? in the realm of sound therapy and vibrational healing? It's a great question. When I first started this work, I was susceptible to all the same traps that many people fall for. And so for the first, I'd say like a couple of years, two, three years, I would probably have repeated or made statements that I would look back now and say, nah, I wouldn't say that in that <laughs> same way today. Now, to get into the whole 432 hertz, 440 hertz thing would be a whole podcast in itself. <laughs> but if I had to really simplify it to your, your listeners, especially someone who has absolutely no idea about any of this stuff, basically, if you look at a piano, right, and you just pick the middle A, like there's A, 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 it's like maybe six or seven octaves of A's, low, mid, high, you pick the middle key, A, and you hit it. And it vibrates. They measure these vibrations. The sound propagation vibrations are measurable in hertz, cycles per second. So in one second, that A with modern tuning should vibrate 440 times. Whoa. Yeah. I didn't know that. So that's how we created a standard that if you buy a guitar or if you listen to an album or you're producing for a film or you're working with a band, everybody tunes their A reference to 440 uh, oscillations per second. And everything is tuned around that as a reference. Therefore, now we can play the song and dance together. So this helped for music production, for collaboration, for basically the whole modern music ecosystem that we know is, is built on this 440 standard, which is a westernized standard uh, practiced across the world. Now, there's been a movement, which I've been a large proponent of, 
to move that pitch from 440 down to 432A. And the reasons why people want to make that shift, it's like a long laundry list of things, right? And it goes back to this frequencyism. It unlocks your DNA. It's the sound of the earth. It's the frequency of the sun. It's the frequency of DMT. It's a frequency that unlocks secrets. I don't know, any one of these claims. So what it does to the receiver of this information, it goes, oh, so if I just listen to 432 cycles per second that goes in my ears instead of 440, then that somehow has like some fundamental physiological difference in my body just because. And that's probably what I would have subscribed to early on. Like, oh, this frequency does a thing. But then what I found is, and where I'm at with it now is, not only do I not perf- want to play the standard 440, which I'm like, yeah, you're right, guys. It's a little bit too sharp. That's not right. It's, it's off. I don't say it's like a conspiracy that it's 440. I don't say that it's damaging to our body because it's 440. I don't say that it's wrong and causing like my brain to crack. Instead, I say that for this kind of atmospheric healing work, you're better off tuning your A to 432 than 440 because that lower tone allows the, the, the low end bass notes and the harmonics to really sit really nicely. Even singers would tell you it's easier to sing with. And so based off of that, like a very circumstantial and, um, you know, individualized evidence that we come across experimenting with it. We know there's something there, but then people go, oh, that must mean it is the frequency of the earth. That must put the stamp that it is some kind of sacred, magical thing. You're still getting stuck on the frequency. I'll say it really clearly right here. The frequency is important. It's not that important. What's more important is what's happening with the sounds. How are the harmonics being revealed, reflected? What's the pacing, the tone, the rhythm? What's the story being told? How much expansion is happening until a compression happens with the sound? How much rising is happening until there's a falling of the sound? Is it moving out or is it moving in? These qualities, these storytelling dynamics is how sound becomes a laffy taffy, sticky, malleable, metallic, aquatic field that is able to enter your mind, your psyche, your body, make a left turn, expand a bit, make a right turn, compress a bit. This is the power of music. So they take all of those things away and say, YouTube, 50 million views, guys cashing checks. (laughs) He's healing DNA. Ooh, ancestral karma is being cleansed. Boo. And I can go home on, on Ableton and hit a sine wave and then put that out there and put some space stuff. And I'll have like 80 billion views or whatever. I'm a little late to the game because, you know, that trend started already, right? But that's, that's the point I'm getting at. The idea that it's so surface level to simply end at the frequency is mystical. So what I say about 432 is it's the Goldilocks zone for A. It's the preferred place to place your A instead of the 440. The difference of eight cycles from 40 to 432, mathematicians and like mystical math people will get into and tell you how the 432 numerologically is more sound. All that's octaves break into nines and you can divide it by eight and by nine and this and that and it connects and the great pyramids of Egypt have the 432 or the 216 or the 864, the octaves incorporated in aspects of its design, its geometry. So now we're starting to see, you know, these numbers show up in architectural, sacred and ancient sites, which then compounds because of the Internet. We have all this information now compounds this idea that, oh, these frequencies are intrinsically, you know, effective or powerful. I think let's slow down. Let's subtract. Let's let's not add on all this stuff. Let's actually slow down and subtract. Let's be very gentle and innocent with our process. Let's put on some sounds, some white noise. Let's play with it a little bit. Let's let's let it sing and let's feel into how it's making us feel. The healing is in the feeling. The process of what's happening mechanically and how we're responding to it is so much more impactful, healing and important than the arbitrary frequency it's tuned to. And what? What is it doing? Is it impacting my vagus nerve? So for that reason, is it, am I producing more white blood cells? Great. You found a correlation. And what? Like that, I realized lately it's that simple to debunk the whole thing is just get to the part of the question where you go, what do I do with that? Why is that significant? That's the way we should be thinking about this stuff. 
So as crazy as the claims might be, it still like relies on that fundamental premise. Okay, what does that mean? What does that do? How can I use this? How is that effective? Is this applicable? That disarms and debunks the entire frequencyism ideology. And there's so much that people, I think, have been misled or have a misunderstanding, even down to earlier talking about plants, speaking to plants, you know, Ikea had a commercial in which they had like plants that were spoken to positively and then negatively and the negative ones died and the positive ones didn't. And so a, gr a team took on this project and they actually replicated the study. What they found is they, they played um, heavy metal, classical music, some other genres, they yelled and cussed with curse words at one of the plants. <laughs> they uh, spoke nicely to one and then the, the control, they just didn't even talk to it or play music to it. And what they found was all the plants did okay. Even the one that was spoken to negatively, they're about the same. The plant in the music category that did the best was the heavy metal one. Because <laughs> heavy metal has palm muted, high, fast, syncopated riffs. And those are sending high frequency oscillations through the air as opposed to like. Oh. So, so that's hitting the leaves and the leaves are getting more stimulated than if they're just like this. The heavy metal it's stimulating the leaves like this. So on account of the air propagation and the leaves being stimulated, then the stems and the, the whole system that the leaves are connected to down to the roots, the whole thing's now like dancing at a high rate. So just like if you were to go out in Venice Beach and join a static dance and just dance your whole body and your fingertips and just like shoot all this energy off, you'd be like, wow, I feel so much more alive and awake. Well, the heavy metal did that to the um, heavy metal plant. So it actually had like the best result. And what they found was that both the positive and negatively spoken to plants also had the same results. Hmm. The only one that was to a detriment and failed was the one that had no music and no, no speech. So simply oscillating air in a space is good for plants, good for animals, good for humans. If you like punk rock, listening to it before you study or while you study is just as effective as someone who listens to classical. Hmm. Classical is not more effective for the brain. It doesn't have more nodes firing off. It's not like Beethoven magically unlocks more of the brain. <laughs> What they found is what you like to listen to is what turns your brain on. And so it's just as much connected to personal preference and ratios and relationships established by local systems than universal frequencies that have universal principles and properties that across the board elicit a general effect. It's not the frequency that has some universal effect. It's the frequency that's based off of the other frequency it's working with then that ratio and relationship is what has a known, measurable, applicable effect. And that's what Pythagorean harmonics and math was about, finding these constants that like kind of transcend, um, but also interconnect these different schools of thought. Nothing added, but I do love the idea that like it's proposing versus imposing. Yes. That's what I liked about you. And of course, I just want to contextualize where, of course, we talked about introductions, but I've personally experienced your sound healing modality, just as I have with Jonathan Chia from Reality Center. Mm -hmm. I take my vetting and research very seriously, and I wouldn't have had you on if I didn't experience it firsthand. And the 20, 25 minutes demo you gave me with your proprietary technology, like the music piece, the vibrational piece, and the frequency piece, that 20 minutes felt like a four hour sleep for me. And I felt rejuvenated. And after that, we ended up talking for four or five hours, right? And then that led us to this point. But I just want to highlight that. And I do really, I love the question you proposed. And what? And I want to segue into these questions because I want to make this very pragmatic. What has been the experience of working on a micro level individually with cancer patients, ER staff, and other individuals that really could benefit from modality because that's the tangible and what, and you're already working with amazing folks because with this social era, with the era of social proof, people get over fixated on the macro, the impact the utilitarian of, I worked with thousands of people, 40,000 people attended my masterminds, but you didn't get lost. You remembered your grounds, the lower, Right. So we'll love for you to talk about the individual impact and how that process and some of the maybe testimonials or some of the changes you've really witnessed within this container of relationship. Absolutely. Um, and thank you. The reason, Ben, why I'm even doing what I do is because 
the first summer where I really discovered and unlocked it and started doing sessions, I was fortunate to be taken to a yoga festival where I immediately plugged into like a 300 person breath work type of session. And people came to me after and they were like, I was like 23, 24 at the time. And they were like, you know, that was incredible. Where can I learn more? And I said, you know, I'm doing private sessions. You should come check out the tent. So they would walk 30 feet to the tent. And I did about six or seven private sessions. I just remember I was like, wow, I could charge like 200 bucks a session for this. Like, and people want to pay that and they're getting benefit. It was, it was crazy. You know, I went home and I said, this is incredible. My whole life I've been told ABC, XYZ, go to school, do this. Like it's unacceptable to do anything else. You're not successful unless you fit these criteria. Here I am. I'm like, I can actually make a living or, you know, and serve people and find my way. So what happened that week was I, um, I helped a woman with sleep problems and she emailed me a week later saying, you need to not go back to your school. You need to drop out and just do what you're doing and just immediately take off because you found it, you're doing it. And a few other people had said something similar to me. So I said, huh, I rented a studio. I started doing sessions in Santa Monica. Two years in, I have this woman, she comes to three of my sessions. She works with veterans. She's actually a, a therapist. So she's hears it all and sees it all. And she's coming to my group sessions for her own healing. She came once. Three weeks later, I see her again. I don't see her for like uh, the next one. But then she comes to a third session within two months. And uh, I see her on the fourth session like a few weeks later. And she says, I just need to tell you something. And she looks, she's glowing. She's smiling. She's just, I was like, hitting on me? Like, what is it? You know, like, <laughs> she like me? Like, what's going on? sparkles in her eyes and she said I just have to tell you she was you know I'm a therapist it's so stressful I work with people all day like it's really hard on me I've done nothing but come to your sessions I haven't changed my life I've done I've just come to three of your sessions my period is back whoa I was like what she goes my cycle has been off for years like I've had hormonal issues I've tried dealing with it but I can't believe it like my cycle was so strong it came back on time it's consistent and I was like, imposter syndrome. I was like, okay, you changed your job. No. I was like, okay, you changed your diet? No. I was like, you started working out? Like, no. I was like, started dating somebody? <laughs> Something. I was looking for anything. Anything that she did to her life that I could reasonably say, okay, it's, it's, there's, a, there's factors here. And she said, I've done nothing different except come to your three sessions. And that last one, I just knocked out. I just remember waking up and I went to sleep that night and I was so rested. And that's all I've done. And I was like, okay, I got to just keep doing this. So, so yeah, in the last year, I've been very fortunate to be hired by some hospitals to work with the ER staff. I worked with about 40 to 45 uh, ER staff per shift. Sometimes it's for morning and night. Sometimes it's just night. One time I just left it in their meditation room. So the overnight shift can just go and like put on headphones anytime. And the feedback I got was incredible. People said something similar to what you said. They're like, in that 20 minutes, I was able to feel like I knocked out for like two, three hours. And when I went back to work, I was just so much more focused and like at ease, whereas usually I have a little bit of tension or thoughts about getting off my shift or what I have to do after work. But it put me in the zone. It put me like in that place of where I can fulfill my job and do it in a really coherent and really calm way. And I think the bottom line for that application, as much as it's really, really good for the um, ER staff in general, it's also really good for anyone getting treatment because you would want your nurse and your surgeon and your doctor to be the most calm, relaxed and coherent state possible. They'll perform better. You're less likely to have to come back for any reason. And it will save a bottom line for the hospital. And so the idea that we could introduce something that's like non-toxic, safe, non-intrusive and effective like music or sound therapy, specifically for me, it's my, my proprietary unique take on it, which I think really leverages its ease its, and, and maximizes the effective power of what, how the sound can work on a person in many ways. It's almost a no-brainer, uh, A, why it's a trend, but B, why we should be leaning more into this in our day-to-day, -day, whether in our car or you know, getting off of work or going to sleep or just in between work shifts because it's so non-intrusive, but it has such a net positive. And it's so like, it, it's such an exponential uh, benefit to you and your health when you start to incorporate this in your life consistently. Like you said, it's such a low cost. Yeah. And of course you 
dedicate a lot of your effort and research and compositions, creating SoundCloud mu Music's playlist, you offer that all for free. And of course, that misses on the preparatory vibrational equipment that comes with your quantum harmonics, right? But as you talked about, we don't need to get fixated on any single variable component, whether it's frequencies or whatever, that's not the point. It's just in relations to. So I just want to really put down a pedestal and on a messaging board because sound wave therapy or psychotherapy or reading a book or life coaching or psychedelic therapy, there are just different vehicles to go down the avenue of change. And I think change requires actions and initiative. And I think that's what we need to focus on. And I think there's a lot of us, like one of my favorite saying is everybody wants healing, but nobody wants to change. Mm. And I think that's especially true now. And I just really want to emphasize that healing, however you define that term, takes time, but change is possible. I used to say change is hard. I reframed it. I now say change is effortful. Mm. And I think effortful things are worthy. I love that. And I, I'd love to add, even add to that. We are always changing. It's like, it's already a happening. The question is, am I able to influence where and how I'm changing? As opposed to change is hard or easy or not. It's like, I'm going to change regardless. I might as well take back and reclaim my um, autonomy and agency over that change. And what's incredible is I'm in my mid thirties now. I'm getting to that age where I'm, I'm definitely not like that 20s mindset is now far behind me and I, I can see the 40s mindsets ahead of me. And I'm in my mid 30s. I'm like, okay, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? How do I want to really build this out? And I realize that I can be and do anything I want to do if I can just be consistent and have the conviction. Everything else will find its way. Like all the avenues and all the doors, doors that I don't even know are possible will immediately present themselves if I'm willing and I have the conviction. You know, that points to this whole quantum nature of this, this reality and this holographic nature is, are we really living here to be subject to everything? Or do we actually have an active role in like choosing our disposition, our mood, our vibrational level, and where and how we find ourselves either tuned into this station or that station? I truly believe it's all there for us. And what you get is what you put. And what you see is what you're willing to. And the second you're able to go beyond your limitations, limited self, which is embracing the ability that change might be hard, but still wanting that for yourself, putting yourself in those circumstances, no risks, no reward. And also having the conviction that you are completely intertwined in a process that predates your ability to even be aware of it, that you signed up for, and that everything is actually working in your interest the second you choose to see it that way, offer a few extra smiles to the world, be a little bit more grateful to people. Like on the way here, I, um, somebody almost cut me off and almost hit me on the road. So I, I just let out like an insult, you know, it's like, ah, and I caught myself and I immediately t t said to that person, actually, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean that. Forgive me. And I said, wow, that's so strange. Usually I would have just let that sit and I would have at least been in that energy and like not thought about the inverse of it, but it's immediate accountability made me take it back and fix it by saying, I want to actually send that guy love. Actually, I hope that guy has a really good day. And I swear within just milliseconds, I was like, that is such a better way of being, thinking, feeling, and operating in the world. And I realized how easy it is to unconscious and subconsciously quickly respond in a negative uh, leaning impulse. And so that is our test, to be mindful, to be aware. That's why we have the sound therapy. So you have the tools to empower your, the level of coherence and activity and action. So you can make positive right actions when you need to, with the awareness required, to consistently make the right choices in which your sustained vibra optimal vibration naturally, like a railroad track, you know, chooses left over right. If you keep ending up on that right path, right path, right path, and you're in a circle, and you're at the same station again, and you're like, oh, I'm going to do things a little bit different, but not enough. And you're at the same station again. It's clearly because you haven't derailed onto that other path. And that either comes down to someone either lacking conviction or self-belief or lacking the trust and the faith that the universe isn't actually against them. It's working for them at any moment. If they were able to pick up that baton, they would reap the benefits of like being a synergistic benefit and extension of the universe in the nature of itself, like for itself. 
It's like the idea of like thought replacing therapy, right? By replacing your thoughts, you change your emotions and actions because that's why I love mental health because you can use psychology as an entry point or you can use physiology entry point. And very counterintuitively, by you choosing to replace your thought with more grateful and graceful filled statements versus cussing them out, you directly change your mental health and emotional health. Mm. That's a lot of people that we forget, right? But speaking of harmonizing, speaking of soundway therapy, where can people check you out? Your projects, your amazing quantum harmonics, your new center that's opening up and everything in between. Benoit, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and equally very, very thrilled uh, to be here and to be with your audience and to speak about all these things. People can find me on Instagram, Facebook, T-O-R-K-O-M-J-I, Torkomji. Um, you can email me, Quantum Harmonics with an X, LA at gmail.com. Instagram has my link tree. I'm, I'm relaunching my website, but our company is called Alternity, A-L-T-E-R-N-I-T-Y dot I-S. And we are launching a downtown LA immersive venue with 30 foot dome, LED wall, huge psych corner and basically really excited to work with the community here in Los Angeles to co-create with other like-minded individuals, intersection between experience, self-care, health and wellness, technology, consciousness, psychedelia, and where all those things come together to benefit the individual and the community that the individual is comprised of. So that is what is my latest project and passion. And I look forward to seeing you and um, hopefully some of the listeners today uh, can come check us out too. Improving the well-being of the self, others, communities, and relationships. That's right. And last thing, the closing remarks I just want to share is in riff of what you shared just now. I really dislike the overfixations in the Western cultures about this elusive idea of unconditional love. I always said this in offline, so I'll share this on online for the first time, where I don't think there's anything wrong with conditional love. Because I view love as an active extension of yourself for others through this act of service. And because extension of self requires proactive effort, I think that's what love is. So even if it's conditional love, so what? Love is love, right? But the way I reframed, and this is from my most recent argument with my fiance, because if you really sit through that discomfort, lessons come. What both of us realize is the way that's feasible to approach this elusive idea of unconditional love is loving despite the conditions, mm. not being limited by the conditions of the circumstances at hand. I think that's the unconditional love we can strive for. Just like your example, despite you almost getting hit by this person, by being cut off, despite the conditions of anger and road rage, you chose to extend a part of yourself through gratitude. And that changed your entire outcome for us of the day. And now we're having this amazing, amazing conversation that I tremendously cherish. And I hope that's the way we close out today's conversation for people to think about. In life, when and where and how can you love someone despite the conditions and the circumstances? And that's just something I wanted to close out today's conversation with. I love that premise. It's all about harmonics, harmonizing, and being at one with our nature. The standing wave is comprised of all of its harmonic overtones, just like a big family tree. So there is an interconnectedness, even down to the primordial sound that is at the beginning and end of all things, that is comprised of all physical material, that is an essence of our own life, our day, night cycle, our rest and activity, is we have to be synchronized and harmonized and at one with the parts and the whole. And I think right there is the intersection of where we exist and it's our choice and it's our opportunity. So I really, I wish you the very best on this podcast, Benoit, and with your work. And uh, thank you for having me and thank you to everybody for uh, tuning in today. And it's, it's been my absolute pleasure. And with that being said, if you have tuned in, I just want to ask you for one favor. If you discover more something about that you can benefit from, from today's amazing conversation, I ask you to share this episode with one friend. It's free for you, but invaluable for the show's growth. And with that, I hope to catch you in the next week's train of Discover More. Thank you for tuning in.